Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Colin's Last Stand. My name is Colin Moriarty. Now, you'll notice that there are two types of Colin's Last Stand videos in the wild now. You have something akin to the Third Amendment video I did, which is more produced and scripted off a teleprompter. And then you have something more akin to what I did with the political compass, which was off the cuff, me just talking into a camera, very much like this. Um, some people have been asking, am I going to still do both types of videos? The answer is yes. This is more akin to the political compass test, but coming up on Thursday and then again the following Monday will be a two-part episode uh, dealing with the same exact topic. Obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be a two-part episode. That's going to be scripted in the style of the Third Amendment video, so stand by for that. We're going to have the best of both worlds, and I want you guys to continue to give me your feedback so we can make these videos as good as possible. And by we, I mean I, of course. Today I want to talk about two different political issues that are happening in the United States, and actually one of them really is happening to the entire world in a way and how these two unrelated topics are actually related in one very specific way, which is politics, or the art of political expediency, and how this is a really destructive way to move forward, uh, and to get people on board, and to do things consistently, and to do things for the right reasons. So the two issues that I want to talk about that are unrelated yet tangentially related, yet somewhat closely related in a specific way, is what's going on in Syria right now, and then what's going on with the Supreme Court specifically with Neil Gorsuch. I'm not going to get into the whole hullabaloo with how Syria started to fall apart around 2011 and, and all of this. You guys can go read about that. I'm sure a lot of you already know what's going on, so I think it would be a little bit redundant for me to do that. I, actually, in the description below, I'm going to link to a Vox video um, that is about six minutes long that actually does a really nice job of explaining what's going on over there. Uh, from a bird's eye view, like a 40,000 feet view. So if you're unfamiliar or need to, to, to you know, kind of uh, delve in and jump down the rabbit hole and figure that out, I'll just, you can just go look at that video. But basically what's happening over there is depending on how you look at it, there's either a three-way or a four-way civil war going on. It's just a complete disaster. And obviously, many Syrians have been funneling themselves into Europe as a result of the crisis there. There's a humanitarian crisis there, obviously. The entire country has been torn apart. And, of course, in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere in the world, uh, a smaller amount of Syrian refugees are being allowed in as well. Really what you have going on there is Assad with his Russian and Iranian allies. Assad, of course, being kind of the ruler of Syria. Let's compare it to what was going on maybe in, like, the 19-teens in Russia. They're the white Syrians, meaning that they're the established the, uh, Syrians, the establishment Syrians. Um, so there's those guys, right? Then you have um, the rebels, that are fighting. This makes it a pure civil war. The rebels that have broken off from Assad. Um, they're supported by Turkey and Saudi Arabia and some other Middle Eastern allies. They're also tangentially supported by, you know, us um, in a way. And they are representative of this movement that even involves some of the military that used to fight for Assad. So it's a very sloppy situation going on over there. Uh, a very confusing situation, muddied waters, all of that. The third group is ISIS, and what you're really dealing with there is really the enemy that we're most concerned about or should be most fixated on. ISIS obviously stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or you can call it ISIL like Barack Obama frustratingly called it over and over and over again and was the only one that called it. That of course stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. But either way, ISIS is our enemy. They've carved out a piece of Syria, they've carved out a piece of Iraq, it's a caliphate now, it's basically their own country, it has a capital city. It's, it's, it's a scary situation, and if, and, and if you really want to get deep into it, the fourth member of the Civil War are the Kurds. What's going on here is very complicated, because it's turning into a proxy war, and of course in the United States, we have a lot of experience with proxy wars. We also have a lot of experience with kind of religious conflicts. This is there's some Sunni-Shiite kind of complexions here as well, and we have to really back up and think about exactly what we're doing and exactly what we're trying to do. Remember that the two most famous proxy wars that we fought following World War II were Korea in the early 1950s, and then the lengthy Vietnam War that technically really started in its own way in the late 40s, early 50s itself, but grew into this outrageous conflict that cost 60,000 uh, US lives, uh, just a ton of money, a ton of problems. We did some illegal acts in places like Cambodia and Laos. It was it was a complete disaster, and the entire idea there was that we were fighting for containment, the idea that we were going to contain communism. The reason I bring those proxy wars up is because we're fighting a proxy war in Syria, or we're at least head, going headlong into a proxy war in Syria, and it's something that I'm concerned about because there are no defined rules. And this is kind of where we're getting into the political ramifications and the political problems that we're having here, because I have to ask just a simple question. Why are we launching missiles at Syrian uh, targets, the Syrian airbase, for instance, that Donald Trump targeted with 50 missiles. Now, let's be clear. 
This isn't a problem that's exclusive to Donald Trump. Barack Obama loved shooting missiles. And remember that Barack Obama also went to Congress to try to uh, get some more official legislative support to fight the good fight over in the Middle East and was rebuffed. So I'm not here blaming Donald Trump or blaming the Republicans. That's not my intention at all. This is a problem with both sides. They just like to blow things up. But again, the major question is, why are we doing this? Ostensibly in Korea and Vietnam, these were wars, again, of communist containment. But it was a silly reason to fight a war. It didn't do anything. The Korean War, by the way, never even ended. It was, it was ended with an armistice in 1953. South Korea and North Korea are still technically in a state of war. We still have tens of thousands of troops in South Korea. So it's something to keep in mind that these kinds of wars don't work. And of course, I don't need to tell you that Vietnam didn't work either. But think about the wars that were fought that had definitions, that were defined, had parameters and end goals. The example that comes to mind for me in the post-war era is Desert Storm. There was a defined goal, which was to get Iraq out of Kuwait. We achieved that goal and then we left. So we knew how it began. We knew what the middle was going to be, like the mid game, and we knew how the end game was going to go. And then we got out. But when you get involved in these endless conflicts for political expediency, it becomes a problem. And that is what it's all about, political expediency. Now, suddenly, lots of Democrats and lots of people in the media like Donald Trump because he's hurling bombs at a country. And yes, I understand. Assad is not a good man. I get that completely. Assad is not a good person. He is using chemical weapons. He has used them before. He will surely use them again. The question we have to ask ourselves is, to what end will we get involved? And what is the end goal? And what does victory look like? Are we just gonna hurl missiles from the Mediterranean Sea, from the safety of the Mediterranean Sea? Or are we gonna talk about doing what's really necessary to take on ISIS specifically? Do, are we willing as a society to, 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 to have that conversation? Or are we just gonna pretend that you know a death by a thousand cuts is gonna do the trick? I have a news flash for everyone. A death, a death by a thousand cuts isn't gonna work here. And getting involved in these quagmires, whether it's from afar or whether it's very intimately with ground troops, is, is just going to be disastrous especially in the Middle East. We're not the only ones to learn this example. Look at what happened to the Soviets in Afghanistan. This isn't something to be taken lightly. When you do things just for political expediency, when you do things just to make a point, it's not a good enough reason to do something. Remember that the congressional Republicans in 2013 were going on and on and on about how they didn't want Obama involved in that. It was unconstitutional for him to do anything there. It's just... It's just such nonsense. Keep in mind also that if ISIS is our major enemy, Assad is fighting ISIS. So are, what, what, to what end are we really getting involved here? What are we trying to achieve? And remember also that this action is frankly inconsistent with the travel ban or the travel restrictions that the Trump administration has tried to push through. We want to help the Syrians, yet we don't want to help the Syrians. It's, th this is inconsistent. And again, it's all back to politics. Here's re really what happened. We saw that Assad used chemical weapons against international law. We all know that. We all know Assad's a bad person doing bad things. And so we launched some missiles to make ourselves look good and feel good. But really, what did it achieve? It put some holes in an airfield that killed a few Syrian soldiers. But the, the, the conflict in, it, it is still going. I don't think it's a good enough answer to do things just for politics, just to give ourselves a pat on the back and say, hey, we did something. And I'll remind you that terrible things happen in the world all the time, and terrible things have happened in the world that we've ignored. If we really want to play this game, and we really want to get involved and engaged with every issue that's going on, then we should just do it. We should be honest with ourselves as a society and say, hey, we're going to be at war constantly with lots of different countries all the time because everyone's mistreating each other. Look what happened with the Rwandan genocide that we didn't get involved in at all. That actually might have been a really reasonable thing to get involved in, but we didn't get involved there because there was no political expediency there. It wasn't It wasn't something we felt like we had to do. It wasn't a, a flashy newspaper headline. We, we, we wouldn't have shown hundreds of millions of dollars worth of aircraft carriers and, 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 and destroyers in the Mediterranean Sea launching Tomahawk missiles. It's not a glamorous thing that Brian Williams could applaud on MSNBC. I mean, we watched Russia move into a sovereign nation just a couple of years ago, take a part of it, and then pretend that nothing happened. We watched Russian-backed rebels shoot an airliner down, killing a bunch of people, including Americans, and did nothing about it. We watched the Russians do this with complete impunity. Keep in mind that the, the Russians annexed a piece of land. It's, like, it's, it's a move straight out of the Nazis' playbook. So all I ask as this story develops with Syria is to ask yourself why we're getting involved and why we're doing anything, and should we have a conversation about doing what's truly necessary to win the war definitively, or should we kind of stay out of it and see how things develop and worry about other issues that are going on in the world? Because we cannot, I repeat, we cannot solve the world's issues. It's not our job and it's not our problem. And it's literally an impossible ask.
So why are we putting ourselves in this position? If we want to go fight in Syria and we want to go fight in ISIS, here's what's going to be necessary. Probably a half a million U.S. soldiers and Marines on the ground, since we're going to be fighting a proxy war with major powers, including Russia and Iran. We're going to have to commit ourselves to losing thousands of those soldiers, committing hundreds of billions, if not over a trillion dollars over the course of this hypothetical conflict. We don't want to do any of that. And I don't blame you for wanting to do any of that. So why even start to scratch the itch again? Politics, politics, optics, newspaper headlines, Sunday show chatter. All of that is all that matters to people in Washington. I mean, just look what's going on on Twitter. People that hated the war and now love the war. People that love the war and now hated the war. It's just all endless politics. It is so tiring. And I know that some people think, well, that's what Washington, D.C. does best. They, they worry about politics and they trifle about politics. Well, we should expect better. We should expect coherence out of Washington. We should expect a foreign policy that is consistent and makes sense. A foreign policy with a plan and with goals. This kind of shit is getting tiring. And I am sick of watching it. Hurling 50 bombs over into Syria is going to do nothing. And this, of course, brings us to the tangentially related, completely unrelated, yet somewhat related Supreme Court. Because what's going on with the Supreme Court is an example of political expediency yet again, headline grabbing yet again, winning in the moment yet again, and not worrying about the long term yet again. I was very clear in 2016 when Antonin Scalia died that that is the luck of the draw. I'm not a huge Barack Obama fan. I certainly relate much more to the Republicans than I do to the Democrats. But again, the man died with Obama in office and Obama had a year left on the clock. And I understand with the Joe Biden shit and all this kind of stuff that made excuses for everyone, but that was his seat to fill. Mitch McConnell played a political game that didn't even look like it was going to work out for him. It did work out. And then the Republicans got their man on the bench. Now, I have no problem with Neil Gorsuch and I have no problem with Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, Harvard uh, educated for his BA and his law degree. Neil Gorsuch, Columbia, Harvard, Oxford. These aren't stupid men. They're both known for being completely moderate. One moderate left, one moderate right. But what the Republicans did here was to just cut off its nose to spite its face, really. It's a really kind of a strange situation because they've eliminated the 60 vote threshold and the ability to filibuster Supreme Court nominations. This is an addition to what Harry Reid did in 2013 when the Democrats controlled the Senate and they eliminated the filibuster and the 60 vote threshold for lower court appointees because they weren't getting the appointees that they wanted or things weren't going quickly enough. The reason I have a problem with this is because the Senate, it's its sad actually to see the Senate just whittle away their own power. The Senate is the only is the only body that's, that's really capable of dealing with this problem and giving itself more power or less power, but it's actually just lessening itself. And now we're going to count on the Senate to one day restore the sanctity of the chamber to restore the balance of power there that's being slowly lost. See, politics can be a problem sometimes and doing things for political reasons is more often a problem than it isn't. In fact, it almost always is a problem because these people, in, these men and these women in the Senate, for instance, just don't care about anything other than getting reelected, other than pleasing the party and the party bosses, other than pleasing their lobbies and their donors. They don't give a shit about the future. They don't give a shit about what the choices they mean now mean later. And I'm not talking about Neil Gorsuch himself being nominated to the Supreme Court and now being installed on the Supreme Court because I'm sure he's going to be a fine justice. The point is, is that they've, they've whittled themselves to such a degree that when the Democrats take back over, there's going to be no need to consult with the minority party, which will at that time be the Republicans, for nominees to the court, whether it's the lower court or the Supreme Court. Whatever the, the major party wants, they're going to get. Why would you do this to yourself? Oh yeah, politics. Winning now, but not worrying about later. See, I understand Harry Reid got the ball rolling here, and Harry Reid really is a schmuck. I'm not going to sit here and pretend otherwise. Harry Reid is a clown. He's just a complete clown. Just a liar, just a, a, a consummate political hack, a partisan. I don't like people like that. And I understand that what he did in 2013 really got the ball rolling on this. But remember that there's someone has to be an adult. Someone can stand up and say, hey, just because this happened doesn't mean we necessarily need to retaliate with, you know, why x happened we retaliate with y to me i i just don't think that it, it, it it's effective i don't think it makes any sense and what i'm super concerned about is the future of the chamber now see mitch mcconnell had the chance to do something really magnanimous and really interesting and i read about this this wasn't a unique idea that i had but i read about it in multiple places which was to say could we go to justice ginsburg or justice Breyer or justice kennedy could we go to one of these people and say hey we have a plan to install merrick garland on the bench in addition to neil gorsuch kind of a goose gander situation, but in a positive way. Get one of those people to retire, 
a liberal can replace a liberal, the conservative can replace the conservative, the balance on the court is kept, and moreover, the adults win. Because suddenly it's not about just winning in the short term. It's not about bending the rules to your will. It's not about saying, hey, we're going to lose, so we have to change the rules during the middle of the game. I just don't understand this. I hate political expediency. They could have done something really cool like that that would have given a lot of people a little bit of faith in the legislative chamber that no one believes in anymore. So while Syria and the Supreme Court are completely unrelated, they're related in that one way, and they're related in a way that all of these other issues in Washington and in state capitals and in local jurisdictions, they're all related in this way. Politics. And politics are interesting. Politics are fun. I love studying politics. I love being in the game. But at some point, we have to ask ourselves, to what end are we doing anything at all? We need adults. We need a plan. We need a goal. We need a list of you do one, then you do two, then you do three, then you get four, and you get five, and you get six. Instead of hurling fucking missiles to, a, to another country to retaliate to something terrible, but nonetheless something that we could do to almost any country in the world. Are we, are we hurling missiles at Mecca? because they won't let women drive and they treat women like shit? Are we, are we, are we hurling missiles at all of these Muslim countries that will fucking kill gay people? No, of course we're not. Because the entire notion of retaliation in this way is hip, it's hypocritical, it's inconsistent, and it's nonsensical. I am no pacifist. I think the United States should always carry a big stick and be willing to use it. But we should be willing to use it with a plan. There is no plan. So next time you see a flashy headline about missiles launching, or next time you see a flashy headline about how the Senate Republicans in this instance won a political victory, think to yourself, who the fuck cares? What's the plan? What's the goal? What is the process by which we will achieve these things? Without the answers to those questions, we can continue to spin our wheels as Rome burns. Well, that's another uplifting episode of Colin's Last Stand. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, this is an independent, fan-funded show. There are no ads baked into the show. There are no product placement. I'm not trying to sell you things you don't need or want. So please consider going to Patreon and supporting this show at the one, five, ten dollar level, whatever you can do. It really is appreciated. And of course, subscribe if you can. Leave some comments. Try to be kind to each other, please. Um, thumb up the video if you want, or thumb it down if you didn't like it. And of course, keep on learning. It's what's most important. I'll see you next time.